Well, while we're waiting for people to gather, let me take a couple of minutes and tell you who I am. My name is Andy Gray. I'm founder and president of Strategy Leaders. Strategy Leaders is a 25-year-old business consulting firm. It was founded as a result of research that was conducted, uh, that I conducted at Columbia University. Um, we're part of a group of people and we were looking at the question of how best to build the 21st century US centric economy. And the solution that came forward loud and clear was uh, to boost the success of privately held owner operated businesses in order to drive the economy forward. In case you didn't know, um, there are about 6 million actively operating two or more employee companies in the United States that are privately held. They make up something like over 99% of all companies in this country. Um, they have a huge failure rate. That was one of the things that caught our attention as we looked at what do you have to do to impact the economy. So they fail or close up or disappear at the rate of three out of four in every 10 year cycle. And um, what also was interesting, however, is that there are as many newcomers as there are those exiting in those 10 year cycles. So what we focused on is that over time, uh, going into this study, the numbers of companies operating in business tends to stay constant at this around $6 million mark. And the question that we were asking then is, how do you raise the economy by getting companies to last a little longer, make a little more while they're in business, and uh, then exit more profitably when they're ready. And that led to starting strategy leaders as a business consulting firm and working with our clients then led to developing additional products and services over time. Valuations is one of the uh, services that we got into offering because of our clients uh, demanding it and asking for the help to better understand what was the value of the asset that they were building. Um, let's take a look at the first poll question, question number one, and see who we have. So we're um, a good chunk of business owners. That's the majority of our population. We do have some employees of privately held companies. That's great. Um, we have some advisors to privately held businesses. Welcome. And I hope we find this is useful and we'd love to connect with you later on as well. And then there are a couple other people here who are curious and on the journey of learning, I suppose. Um, as we go through today's webinar, if you like what you see and you want to hear more or keep going on your learning journey, um, our next webinar will be a kickoff to our 2022 series. It will be coming up probably the end of January at the latest, the beginning of February. And um, I would very much love to have as many of you attend as are interested. It's going to be on growth by acquisition and how and why to buy a business. It's for both buyers and sellers of businesses. Uh, it takes you on the journey from how to get started with putting a deal together to actually getting it over the finish line. Uh, I would also invite all of you to feel free to weigh in today with topics that you'd like us to cover in 2022. Uh, you can use today's chat or email us with questions and requests. And with that in mind, here is our contact information. Uh, I've given you uh, three different email addresses. Some of you know uh, some of us here at Strategy Leaders. Uh, feel free to contact any of us. And uh, at the same time as we go through today's webinar, if you'd like to get an invite for, to, for the January webinar, you want a copy of today's presentation, you want us to individually follow up because you have questions, you're looking for information, please let us know. Um, we'd love to hear from you and um, uh, either use the chat window or, or use one of these alternate routes. So with that, let's dive into the agenda for today. And um, here are the to top table of contents for today. As, we, as I go over this, we're gonna launch our Next question, which is for those of you who are thinking about getting us uh, getting evaluation, tell us about your plans for getting evaluation. 
And um, in terms of um, the co topics, uh, Dahlia, are you there? Can you launch the next poll question? Uh, may have a, be having a technical difficulty there. Um, in any case, in terms of uh, today's agenda, we're going to get into why do evaluation, what is evaluation, what's the definition of evaluation, which valuation to use. Uh, there we go, there's our poll question. Um, you can slide that over to the side and take a look at the questions. Um, you're thinking about getting evaluation either for looking at the long-term value, long-term planning, selling or buying a business, or it may not apply to your situation or you're not an owner. Um, pick the answer that works best for you. Um, as I said, in terms of topics today, we are gonna dig into which valuation to use in which conditions. Um, and we're gonna give you some variables and some case studies so you get a better understanding of what to think about as you're working on evaluation for your business. And then finally, what to look for in terms of the people that you will want to end up working with. Um, I will say, uh, let's bring up the results of this poll question. Do we have enough responses to do that? Um, so most of you are thinking about valuation for long-term planning. I gotta tell you, that's great. Uh, the, some of you are thinking about selling and negotiating with a buyer or buying a business, or it doesn't apply. I would suggest that those of you that are thinking about long-term planning, also think about this idea of buying a business to facilitate growth, because it will give you a lot of experience with what the exit side will be like. And again, if you want more information on that, come back in January and we'll talk more about that. Uh, I will say that it is not uh, very common for business owners to be curious about valuations, but not to actually follow through and get one. And let's take a look now at some of the big roadblocks to getting a valuation. Whoops, wrong direction. There we go. Um, the, here are some of the most common reasons that we hear from business owners why they don't have an up-to-date valuation. Uh, first one, it's expensive, uh, 10 to 50K and up is a pretty common set of numbers. And that I would say would be enough to stall me from thinking about getting one done. I can offer to you that ours uh, is using a systematic approach and allows us to get that cost way down to well under $5,000 as a starting point to get a, a valuation for the business. In terms of um, time consuming, that second box, Four weeks to months to complete evaluation is not unusual. Uh, and again, with our system, we can turn it around within a few days so that we're not pulling the business owner out of uh, the business for a long period of time, but rather taking a very quick look at where you stand. Yeah, the third issue, it can be complicated. Fact finding can be very lengthy. It takes the business owner away from running their business. And I'll tell you, we've worked very hard to simplify all of that. It's down to give us some three tax returns, answer a short questionnaire, and you're well on your way to getting your valuation uh, done and back in your hands. This last one, not now, uh, I see it a lot. Uh, business owners tend to wait until a life event drives them uh, or forces the issue, something like a partner exit, a, the need to sell the business, the loss of a key player. And oftentimes that life event is the most inconvenient time to have a valuation completed. So this list of issues must be pretty compelling uh, because 98% of business owners don't actually know what their business is worth when we, when we do polls of companies and we've seen other polls with similar results. Uh, when it comes to an alternative and not having a valuation, there are some things that you wanna consider and let's, let's launch a poll question here. When it comes to a valuation for my business, why should I get a valuation? Um, let's hear where you guys stand in terms of having evaluation right now. And as you answer this one, I'll take you through some of these other tidbits. So self-employed people, business owners tend to have about a three and a half times greater net worth than uh, employees. So certainly is value to be protected. 
80% uh, of business owners don't have an exit plan. 70% uh, of M&A professionals say business owners aren't prepared to sell or transfer their companies. 40% of business owners lack retirement savings. Most owners plan or count on the business as filling that gap and uh, the profit from selling the business to help with retirement. Most business owners do overestimate their company's value by about 50% or more. Uh, people don't realize when they're building the business that spending to avoid taxes is actually the opposite thing to do from building value. And when it comes to valuing the company and understanding what the value is, something like 65 to 80% of a typical business owner's net worth is tied up in the business. But the second piece, 50% of business owners fail to monetize that value at exit. We think that's a huge waste. It's a huge shame. It's not something that we want to see happen. Uh, before we go anywhere else, let's hear from all of you on this poll question where you stand on getting a valuation. So some of you haven't, but it's outdated. Uh, actually, this is really interesting. Not one of you said you had a current valuation in place. I hope this will motivate you to do something. Come to us. We'd love to help you or go someplace else, but get a valuation in place so you know the facts that you're dealing with. Uh, many of you have thought about getting a valuation, don't have one yet, or never thought about it. That's also a chunk of you. Um, and then again, as usual, there's a few of you who are here, um, but not necessarily business owners. So it doesn't necessarily apply. Okay. Now, in our opinion, that list that we just looked at, um, is the lack of a current valuation is at the heart of all, all of those issues. Uh, without a valuation, you're essentially running blind long-term and it's hard to know where you are when it comes to building value, planning out your strategy and monetizing your most valuable asset, your company. Uh, so now that I hope I have you at least a little bit disturbed, I want to remind you that this is all about the ultimate success factor, getting paid for your sweat equity. And let's go take a look at the top 10 reasons for getting a valuation. And as I take you through this, we're gonna take one more poll question. Um, let's take a look at the most common reason for getting a valuation, which is planning to exit. And let's just find out how far away from you exit you really are. Because we wanna give you a little bit of thinking process here on where the valuation will fit in. Um, other reasons besides just exit in, in terms of getting a valuation is to better understand your business and its potential plan for retirement, make sure that your family's properly protected, create a succession plan for the business, pay the right amount when you do buy a business, get what your business is worth at sale, create buy-sell agreements, look at funding opportunities and establish underlying value that would support those funding opportunities, create an estate plan um, or a trust and prepare for taxable events such as gifting or grants or documenting the value at sale. So with that in mind, let's look at the answers to this poll question of planning to exit. And if you can bring up the poll results, let's see how far out uh, all of you are. Uh, do we have the responses on that one? Okay, we it looks like there might have been a technical difficulty. Someone is saying they weren't able to answer it. Maybe okay. relaunch it. Yeah, let's I'll try relaunch to relaunch it. And let's just give you guys a minute to absorb this page and go give it a try. Let's see what happens here. We've got an extra couple minutes. So let can you guys All right, looks like it's looks like it's going now. Okay, great. So how far out from exit are you uh, as a business owner? And let us know your choices. We'll give you a minute here. Give you a chance to absorb this page. And I hope this page is starting to get you motivated to think about valuation now. And let me know when you're ready to flip it. Okay. Um, good news. A uh, small part of the population is thinking about exiting within the next year. Uh, 
if you're planning on getting out within a year, you've got to move very, very quickly. And I would absolutely get a foundation. Where do I stand and use that to compare to what do I need in order to retire properly or move on with my plans after the business? Um, there's a pretty good even split between get out in three years, get out in five years. Some of you are doing some five to 10 year and over 10 year thinking. So good for you guys. I'm glad to have you here. Um, establish a baseline and then you can use this the valuation system to um, measure your progress as you continue to work and then I'm glad to see some of you here without a time frame and just learning beginning to think about the topic so thank you for that feedback and let's shift gears and get to the meat of today's presentation um in the next uh, group of slides, we're going to dive into details that you're going to want to know about. We're going to start with a basic definition. What is a valuation? We're going to look at different types of valuations. We're going to dig into a few case studies. We're then going to talk about who does valuations and what you should look for or demand when you think about hiring uh, people to do a valuation for you. And as we go through this next slide, what is evaluation? Um, here's the definition. It's an estimate of value of what the business is worth. It is based on tax returns, financial performance reports, an outlook for future performance. So what is the outlook of the business look like in terms of your planning, where you're taking the business and where you think a buyer could take it after that. Uh, it takes into account economic or market conditions, and it absolutely, absolutely should include comparative databases. So this is kind of like having comps on a house. What's, what's available in the marketplace that is similar to what you have? But there is also more than just one type of valuation. Uh, different needs require different values tied to different ways that a business can be sold, or in the case of liquidation, closed up. So that's what we're going to look at next. We're going to look at the four most common types of valuation. And you see across the top of the page here, equity, asset, enterprise, and liquidation. Those are the four kinds of values that we uh, focus on. Uh, in the band underneath, you see insiders outsiders, equity, leverage, and shutdown. Those are the people that would be most likely to use that value. So equity value would be insiders in the business. Asset or sale value would be outsiders who are looking for protection from particularly undisclosed liabilities where they would take assets of the business and then start a new company with the assets that they acquire. Enterprise is more typical for a company that is middle market and demonstrating the leverage of private equity investment. And then over on the right is what happens if you shut the business down. So we're just going to do a hard stop, which is a comparative number I think you always need to be looking at and aware. Um, our, our recommendation is to make sure that you do get all four valuations. And here you can see that the same company, same set of operating conditions, same future, four very different values in terms of selling the business that range from nearly 7 million all the way down to just over a half a million dollars in value. Uh, now we're going to go take a look at three case studies. Uh, and as we go through this webinar, again, if you have questions about the slides that we're talking about, please put them in the chat window. We're going to save them for the end of the webinar, but we will come back and address them and, and glad to do so. Uh, in terms of this case study, we have three of them, the same company, but with different NAICS codes. I'll get into what NAICS codes are in a minute. Then we're going to look at um, uh, comparing two different companies and which one has more value. And we're actually going to have a little fun with that and let you vote on which company you like more. And then lastly, we're going to take a look at how inputs and information that you're providing uh, and how it's being used can lead to different outcomes in terms of the valuation. So let's start here with NAICS codes. NAICS codes are defined here on this page. Uh, they are the code that 
represents the industry classification for your business. And you see here NAICS code one and NAICS code two and a dollar amount next to each one. Again, this is exactly the same company, exactly the same type of sale. This was for an asset sale, very different value outcomes based on whether or not, whether you use NAICS code one or NAICS code two. Um, and the NAICS code is on your tax return. It is selected by you and your accountant. You can change it anytime you want without any paperwork at all. And if you do want some input, you can talk to the Census Bureau who is the governor for NAICS codes. And I will caution you that it can impact SAC tax SAM awards for those of you doing government work as well as tax incentives. So it's, it's worth paying some attention to. But in this case, here's an example of why this might happen. Um, we, we've really carefully checked this and actually helped clients strategize and make sure they have the right next codes. But a couple of examples, you have a taxi company versus a limousine company. Taxi company is assumed to have much less in terms of investment, its employees and its equipment and infrastructure. Another example would be a piecemeal manufacturer versus a specialty manufacturer, maybe a high-end pharmaceutical manufacturer with clean rooms and so on, um, or, or um, someone who's doing um, uh, computer chip work. Uh, another example would be a painting contractor, which tends to have a low, more specialized but lower skill um, amassed within the company versus a general contractor versus an engineering firm. So again, many times the accountant will pick an X code for a company. It's not necessarily the best representation, but nobody pays attention to it. I'm hoping um, all of you are going to go back, pull out your tax returns and take a look at it. Now we're going to look at two companies and which company has more value. Company number one is bigger. They have about twice the revenue, huge growth in net income, three and a half times greater owner's compensation. They do have inventory. They have more fixed assets on hand. They have about a one-to-one -one ratio between cash and net income. Net income. Uh, they do have big infrastructure and the cost operates about $6 million. In the second company, they're smaller. They have about half the revenue. They did experience a drop in year-over-year -year net income and a drop in year-over-year -year owner's compensation. There is no inventory. They drop their drop uh, fixed assets dropped, although their fixed assets were smaller. Um, one to one cash to net income, very much like the uh, company number one. Smaller infrastructure. Their cost operates around two point three million. So now we're going to bring up a data table. This is a, an example of what you might want to get back to look at in detail in your own valuation to make sure that you have the right data represented. But for this example, we've got the data on company one and the data on company two. And I'm going to let you guys take a look at it for a minute while I take a sip of water here. And then we're going to ask you to weigh in which company do you think has more value? So take a look, see if you can digest this a little bit. Um, Dahlia, why don't you bring up the poll question and let people weigh in. If you're still looking at the data, you can move the poll question around, I believe, and get it out of your way. And pick your choices. And Dahlia, why don't you let us know when we've got uh, enough answers to our poll question. So let's hear what your Will votes do. are. What? Will do. Okay. You guys are thinking away. Are we getting answers in there? Yes, we are. Okay, good. I'm gonna give it a couple more, like a minute here to let everyone answer. Okay. I think it's always fun to play one of these games. <clears throat> Think of it this way, which company would I want to own? All right, I think we're ready. Okay, let's take a look. So 
nine percent of you thought that company one had more value and 90 percent of you or 10 10 percent thought company one had more value and 90 percent liked company two better and let's go take a look so company one came in at about 2.7 million not a bad take Company two came in with a valuation of 7 million. Why did that happen? Well, company number one had some issues to deal with. They're two and a half times more expensive to operate. They have 10 times more accounts payable and short-term liabilities. They do have some long-term debt to clean up and they have as, about half as much equity, which is made up of assets minus liabilities. Company number two, higher net income, both on a dollar basis and a percentage basis, more cash on hand. They're close to debt free and they're all assets, essentially all assets and no liabilities. So now that we've got that one, let's go to case number three. One second here. Hang on one second, guys. I just have to grab something here. Right with you. All right, so this third case is looking at how tax return inputs can impact the value of the business. Um, and one of the things that I want you to keep in mind is garbage in, garbage out. You are responsible, it's your company. You're responsible for conveying information to the person that's doing the value. As you work with the person who's doing the value, you want to review and make sure that they got it right and that you understand their interpretation of the value of the business and that as they work with you on putting together a valuation for the business that you can play what if with them and um, if that if you have any questions on what's in there that they can document and explain to you where it came from off your tax return and why it's in a particular bucket. Uh, we circled two items here for you to look at. One is op officer compensation. Now, keep in mind, officer compensation is not just how much did you get in shareholder distributions, but it's other items that you might be paid for, uh, you might have paid for, but if we replaced you with someone as an employee in the business, we wouldn't necessarily pay them. So it could be bonuses, it could be travel, it could be um, a very high value uh, uh, life insurance policy or um, health insurance. There's a, a variety of stuff that we might move out of expenses and into officer compensation, which actually is a good thing in terms of boosting value for the company. Um, the net net on this is don't just trust that the valuation expert gets the data correct go over it with them and make sure you understand where it came from. Uh, the second item on here, accounts receivable. Keep in mind that most tax returns are filed on a cash basis. Accounts receivable does not have to be recorded, but depending on the valuation, it may come into play in terms of the value of the business. And it is certainly an important number to know. Um, over on the right, you see a bunch of questions that we've put out here. And this is something that we'll go over with anyone we're doing evaluation with. I'm gonna answer a couple of these questions. One that we hear very commonly, I have some off the books revenue and net income. What happens to that? The answer is nothing. So when you do evaluation, it is based on the tax return. The reason for that, it's the only document 
When you sign it, if you lie on it, you go to jail. And when someone is looking to buy the business, they are looking for underlying proof sources, and this is one of the best ones they can use. Um, what if expenses include owner's comp? I just talked about that a little bit. So we move it, we make a decision with the owner, what should come out of expenses, go to owner's comp, which then contributes to profits. Um, what will it cost to replace the owner is part of this discussion. We're doing that right now, actually, on evaluation with a business owner where there's two partners. One partner actually is not working in the business and their compensation is all officer comp. The other will have to be replaced. They are working in the business and so we'll have to keep some of the money that they have been paid um, in the books as part of the expenses to replace that individual. Um, are all liabilities disclosed? You better be careful on this one because once you get a valuation, and we'll talk about this again in January, and you go into a deal, there's a due diligence period, and it would be very difficult for someone to go through due diligence and hide any undisclosed liabilities if whoever's buying the business is doing any of their homework at all. Um, make sure that you understand a tax write-off does not equate to a profitable and productive business. So those of you who are doing tax planning, let me bring it down and pay as little in taxes as I can. We'll pay a real high price when it comes to selling the business. So you want to make sure that you actually are conveying a profitable business. What happens if revenue drops? What happens to profits? Again, as you saw in the previous valuation, the company had um, company number two had actually experienced some drop in net income and drop to profits, and they were actually still able to retain a huge value because of the underlying uh, history of the business. And how big is the risk of paying off the deal? That's definitely a question as a seller that you want to be able to answer, and as a buyer, you want to be able to figure out. Um, now, let's uh, change topics and talk about who actually does valuations. Um, here's a list of folks uh, that typically get engaged with doing valuations, accountants, brokers, valuation firms, and I will tell you, I see wildly varying results, even within a category of, of uh, people doing valuations, it, it can be a very subjective sort of thing. Uh, watch out for the last item on this page, the network of peers. It's the most common source of business owners uh, information, and it is often the most in, uh, inaccurate. So I find business owners are constantly talking to their peers and saying, well, what did you sell your business for? You know, how did you get to that value? When, you, when it comes time to sell, what have you heard businesses are going for? Um, I want you to make sure that you actually base your decisions on facts, not on the rumor mill. And when it comes for someone that you're going to look for to do a valuation, I want you to be very demanding as well. And I am interested, before we go to the next slide, in knowing the group's experience with valuations. So let's launch our last Poll here. Uh, Dolly, can you bring it up, your experience with doing valuations? And we'll give you a minute to weigh in here. Um, so never seen a valuation, seen one, thought it was complete and accurate, seen one, wasn't detailed enough, seen one, didn't trust the results. So pick one. Uh, those of you that, um, uh, as you weigh in here, we're going to then move into how do you pick the right person to help you and the right system to, to help you. And Dahlia, let me know when you're ready to bring this answer up. Okay, so um, half of you have never seen evaluation. I'm really glad you're here. Um, what you want to see in the valuation is what we're going to get into next. A uh, chunk of you have seen a valuation and thought it was complete and accurate. That's great. That's a quarter of you. Uh, some of you uh, thought that you saw one, but it wasn't detailed enough. I can agree with that. I have seen valuations that are nothing more than an email. Here's the value. 
um, and didn't trust the results, there's a chunk of you who are in that bucket as well. Um, so now um, let's go on to the next slide and take a look at what you want to be demanding about. Um, there are four components to getting the right valuation, the right system, the right people, the right tools, and the right price. And um, when in terms of digging into each one of these four factors, um, I, I, I cannot emphasize enough, do your homework. In terms of the right system, you want a system that plays by the rules. It uses factual data that's well-documented that you can understand where it came from and why. It's a system that uses what we call NACFA principles. NACFA is one of the governing organizations and certifying organizations for people who do valuations. It's built by a qualified, experienced, credentialed, and capable team uh, who are following NACFA principles. It uses comparative databases underlying the system so that you are getting comps. It gives you a variety of valuation outcomes. We showed you earlier that it is possible to get four different outcomes and we think that that data is really important to get your hands on so you want to see that um, whoever's going to do the valuation for you can demonstrate that they can provide that we want something that's very easy to update so as conditions change over time you go through another year you complete another tax return without a whole lot of effort you can get it updated and the last item, three separate approaches for each valuation. Let me explain to you what I mean by that. When you do a valuation, you come up with a number. So we showed you four different numbers earlier. To do a valuation takes a lot of comparative ca calculations. And there has to be a broad data set behind the numbers. Um, and in terms of doing it, the three valuations that should be behind it are called the market approach, income, and rules of thumb. Market approach analyzes recent comps. So it's a comparison. It's like talking to your realtor about what's sold in your area. The income calculation uses company data. It estimates value through multiples, cap rates, discounts rates. Essentially, it's a calculation. And then rule of thumb is an estimate based on your industry rules and practices. For example, in our industry, typically company will pay one times revenue or at a particular size, they'll multiply the seller's discretionary earnings by X. Now, remember we showed you four valuations, three sets of calculations for each one of them. You're talking about 12 calculations to get to the heart of what you are looking at for valuations on your business. And that is part of why when they're done manually, valuations can get to be so expensive. Now let's look at the next component, the right people. Here's a list of things we want you to look for. People that you can talk to honestly and openly. They're good listeners. They're good at explaining things. They're easy to work with. They will take the time to evaluate your data. So not just hand it over and, and they'll do what they're going to do, but they're actually going to evaluate it and ask you questions. They'll make time to dig in with you if you've got questions. They're willing to offer insights and follow professional standards is very, very important. They have extensive experience doing valuations and they can get more backup if they need it to bring it into the picture. And they can provide advice on issues and opportunities, both pre and post valuation. Um, the next item that you're gonna look for is the right tools. And um, in terms of the right, right tools, you want something that is well-defined and easy to understand. Um, and there are transparent data tables. So for example, that data table that I showed you on company one and company two should be there in the, in the packet that you get. And it's, that data is presented to clarify information and also as a basis for you to discuss with the buyer or the seller how, what information you're presenting. You do want the multiple incomes, which I've talked about a lot. You do wanna get KPIs as well. So key performance indicators, where the business stands against its peer group, what's working, what's not, 
what to focus on, which is advice both for the buyer and the seller. You want to have a way to accurately measure the progress your company is making, and you want to have a planning tool, the ability to analyze the now, play what if, model changes, and forecast outcomes. If you can get all of this right, then you have a way to help sellers demonstrate the future value of the business and help about buyers evaluate the risk they're going to be taking on, which is what the deal is all about. And then finally, you want the right price. Um, you want something that's affordable. And I will tell you, you really need to start with a valuation that's well under $5,000. Um, if you need it for court case or something like that, the price will go up as the documentation requirements increase, but still you need to start with an underlying valuation that's very clear and doesn't cost you a ton of money to get. You want an all-in cost uh, uh, proposal that includes the advice that um, the advisor is gonna provide to you or the valuer is going to provide to you. Um, so there are no plus, plus, pluses to this. You want to be able to do revisions to the current valuation at no cost. So the first time that they run the calculations, there are going to be questions. And you may want to come back and ask uh, to change data within the data tables. And that should be OK to do. And you shouldn't be paying to have to um, update that. And then finally, you want to be able to do updates later at a minimal cost. So as I said, next time you get a tax return, you want to update the valuation and not have to pay a fortune to get that done. Now, let's finish up today's webinar by talking about what to do with the knowledge that you're gaining. So first of all, you want to focus on building value every year. You want to get annual valuation updates. You want to prepare for sale or acquisition, um, which means get the company trigger ready. Um, you want to continuously co cultivate opportunity, which means learn more about buying and selling and actually engage in those and use valuations and get comfortable using them to do that. And then finally, you want to evaluate any potential deal that you look at carefully and accurately. And if you can, sit in on deals that somebody else is doing and see how the process goes. Um, lastly, I'm going to go to one slide on how ways that we can help. So here's the advertisement for today. Uh, as we take questions, let me remind you that we are here to help. We do business growth programs with business plans. So we help companies grow and develop. Uh, we do next generation planning and implementation, whether that's family members or employees or bringing in outsiders. We will work on buyer or seller advisory. So you're trying to get through a deal. How do you get it over the finish line, which we have a great track record at doing. We, will, we do valuations and KPI assessments, which is what we're talking about primarily today. We do work on management team development, and we do a lot of work, well over half of our practice, in some way touches on family preparations and negotiations. So with that in mind, we'll gladly take a phone call or get on a Zoom call to talk with you if you have questions you want to take up privately. And right now, we're going to go to questions. So we've got a good 15 minutes here before this webinar is over. Let's see what questions we've got. Uh, guys, you wanna throw the first question at me? Sure thing. So first question, um, what is your feeling about pipeline and conversion reporting and revenue data integrity contributing to evaluation? Say that one again. What's your feeling about pipeline and conversion reporting and revenue data integrity contributing to, value, to evaluation? Well. The, the, the integrity is essential. And again, I will tell you that anybody that knows what they're doing and is following NACPA principles is going to base it on uh, tax returns. If you have unreported data, first of all, you probably don't want to talk about it because you're going to be in trouble with the government if it does get discussed. Uh, and secondly, there's no way to document it without an audit, which would be incredibly expensive. So the data integrity is, is fundamental. And I, it also will come into play when you are working in the deal. So the steps in a deal are you present evaluation, you get a letter of intent from a buyer, and then 
once you guys have agreed to a general price and how it's going to get paid, you go into due diligence. And anybody who knows what they're doing in terms of buying is going to come through and go through the company in, with a fine tooth comb. Now, in terms of the pipeline, I'm assuming you're talking about what business potential is there for the future. And it is important to have a pipeline because what if I'm a buyer, what I'm looking for is future opportunity, both what I can capitalize on that you've been working to grow on and then where else I can go with ideas that I may come up with uh, beyond what you've thought of. So it is important to me for you to show me potential in the pipeline. Um, the more poorly documented it is, the more likely I'm going to be to either discount it or only pay you um, a commission over time if it actually shows up. Let's try the next question. Okay, great. Um, so next question. When buying a business, who should be responsible for paying for evaluation, the seller or the buyer? Um, really good question. And um, let me just come back to that pipeline question. One more thing. One of the things that we can do for you, if you're interested, is we can run the day, run the valuation based on historical data. So up through the most recent tax return, and we can model it for you with future data. If you want to get a picture of what are things, what would happen if we play out the next year, year the way we think we want to. So um, to that question. Um, coming back to uh, this next question, and um, uh, could you just read the question for me again, Dahlia? Sorry. No problem. When buying a business, who should be responsible for paying for the valuation, the seller okay. or the buyer? Um, I will, I, I've seen all different kinds of solutions. Uh, I tell buyers a lot of times that you should tell sellers that you're not interested in starting negotiations until the seller can present you with a valuation um, because you wanna have a basis for starting the negotiation that you know is at least within the ballpark of reality. And uh, keeping in mind that most business owners overestimate the value of their business by 50%, you don't wanna waste a lot of time on someone that may have an unrealistic idea of what their business is worth. Um, so you start with show me evaluation and then we can start negotiating what and how we would do a deal. Uh, some sellers uh, will pay for it just to get it out of the way. Some buyers will offer to pay for it or pay for part of it. I generally will recommend if you're going to offer to pay for part of it, don't pay for all of it. Don't make it too easy. Make sure that seller is committed to the process. Uh, and um, then you can also agree if I buy the business, I'll reimburse you for it once we buy the business. So there's lots of ways to do that. Okay, great. Next question is, how would you forensically validate submitted data? Um, so the tax return is the, the first line of defense. So you take the tax return, and you use that data. The second line of defense, is, if you're going into a deal, is uh, due diligence. So you're going to pull data from the company to validate the what's on the tax returns and prove those out. Um, the third line of defense would be to actually have someone come in and do a full audit. And um, that audit would happen before, during, or after uh, or as part of due diligence. So before making an offer usually is not when that happens, unless as a seller, I want to prove that the data is there. Um, now, in the case of, for instance, ESOP companies, ESOP companies have to get a valuation every year, and but they are also required to provide, um, essentially provide a full audit every year. So that's data that they're using. They're in a routine, but audits can be pretty expensive to do. Next. The questions are rolling in. Okay. Um, <laughs> the next one is what data is most commonly used in valuations? So the data that's used is the tax return and then a questionnaire. The questionnaire looks at some questions. Um, what's the purpose of the valuation? Um, are there any um, uh, assets that might not be obvious on the tax return? So for instance, is there intellectual property? If so, uh, how has that been valued? 
Um, does the company own real estate? If so, is that held inside the company or in a separate asset? And will that be part of the transaction or not? And if it is, how is that going to be valued? Those kinds of questions. So there are um, uh, what's the ownership structure, who owns what percent of the business, which again will be on the tax return, but you want to re-verify that information because I've seen tax returns where that's not accurately reported in the most recent tax return or relative to the next most recent tax return, there's a change coming. Okay, next. great. Um, how do you value breakthrough technologies versus market share and revenues? Um, so breakthrough technologies, um, you need someone who is a specialist at that. Um, I'm assuming you're talking about, I've got a gazelle and um, this gazelle has huge leverage potential and very little history. And I will tell you, that's not where we specialize and that you wouldn't necessarily come to us for that because what we're looking at and modeling is more both the historical performance of the business and then the future potential based on, on how the business has performed up to now and what we're adding into it as we look at the future. Um, when you're looking at huge leverage, you may get that answer through the private equity or the um, enterprise value, but you also probably are gonna want someone who is a leading authority in the industry to weigh in on the potential valuation opportunity. At the same time, you're probably gonna to sell to a specialty buyer who knows something about what they're doing in terms of taking that risk on. Next. Okay. If a business is very small, 200K revenue per year, what are the minimum things that need to be in place to have a valuation? Uh, again, at any size, you can get evaluation done, you just have to have tax returns. So uh, I would make sure that you are filing a tax return. Um, a very small company might be filing the tax return as a DBA on a personal return. You can still pull that information out of the tax return and run the valuation. Um, I would say with a very small company, again, you want to make sure that you are getting a very inexpensive valuation so that you have a better um, payoff ratio in terms of the cost of the valuation to what it's going to do for you. And generally, I would say you'd update that every, every couple of years, not every year. Um, and what you're trying to do is just use it to plan out how is this going to fit into my retirement plan. Great. Next one is, does the balance sheet fall under your talking point speaking to the tax return? Um, so there are balance sheet elements within the tax return. And we also, when we do evaluation, we do a fairly extensive discussion with the business owner about items that are on the balance sheet and correlating, making sure that that is accurately correlated against the tax return or that um, if there are adjustments. So for example, I used that accounts receivable example earlier that tax returns on a cash basis don't have to report accounts receivable, but when we're doing the valuation, it's an important number to know. So we would help the business owner to, and or the business owner's accountant, we would work with them to get an accurate report. And then we'd prepare the underlying data table as part of the package to say, here's where the data came from. Great. Um, the next question is, are long-term customer contracts counted as assets? So long-term customer contracts have great value. Um, the longer and the more solid, the better. Um, you will have to prove that out during your due diligence, of course. And that's part of what we look at when we're evaluating the company is things like um, uh, how, uh, how long-term or how vulnerable is the revenue. And we also look at concentration of customers. So if your, your revenue is highly concentrated within a couple of customers, that actually is going to lower your value and is something you wanna be working on um, diffusing that risk uh, if you have a few years to work on to get ready for exit. And um, so yes, those are factors that are very important and, and part of the questionnaire that we go through with our clients. Next. Awesome. Okay, so next question 
is from Scott. He asks, do your services include helping to find potential and credible sellers? Um, in- we have we have helped clients do that um, either on the buy side or on the sell side. And um, it it is, again, it's a in my opinion, it's a matter of setting up a system so that you can contact people. You've got a broad list of people and you can then uh, go out and talk to the marketplace and find out who's interested in having a conversation with you. If you're interested in that topic, please come back to the a January webinar, make sure we have your email so we can send you an invite. We're ready to roll with that one. Um, and we do dig into that. Okay, great. Uh, next question. Do you explore CRM driven reports to validate projections on future revenue performance? Um, so we are, we will look at it. Um, there's a difference between offering an opinion and offering um, uh, information. And what we try very hard to do is to offer information that the buyer and the seller can both look at and discuss and then use as part of their negotiation. Um, So it is very difficult when you're looking at a CRM system to say, hey, next year I can pop out $6 million. Anybody that was doing that a couple of years ago, right before COVID would have had a lot of mud on their face, depending on the business that they were talking about. And actually there were businesses that went into COVID thinking things were gonna be pretty terrible, pivoted fast, and then ended up with a whole new portfolio of customers. So that's one of those challenging uh, issues that you wanna make sure Um, that you can talk to it as a seller or you're asking questions about it as a buyer, but you're also are thinking about when I put this deal together, what happens if that does or doesn't play out? Okay, great. Um, So now we have a question from Alan. He said this during the presentation. He said, I can claim anywhere from zero net income to $4 million, depending on how depreciation is handled. Why would I want to claim all that income and pay all that tax? Isn't that just pulling money out of the business that could be used to fund growth? Um, So depreciation is definitely something that you can use as a tool in your tax planning. But in order to get depreciation, you have to spend money on buying, typically equipment is the most common one that gets depreciated. And so you have to look at, am I buying things that will depreciate in value over time? And how is that adding value to the business? So can I make money on the things that I'm spending money on? Or am I actually simply saving money on taxes. In in my experience, it, it comes home to roost either now you make more money now because you're saving on taxes or you make money when you exit the business because you can demonstrate to the seller that you have a profitable business. Using depreciation as a tool isn't necessarily in and of itself going to harm you. We actually will go through and figure out where the depreciation is. And that is a factor that comes into play in terms of uh, theoretically improving the value of the business against the stated net income. But you need to be conscious as a business owner um, that um, what what am I spending and how much am I making on that equipment that I'm buying? Okay, great. So next question, are there different criteria for valuing brick and mortar or traditional businesses versus tech slash SSS, sorry, SAAS companies? SAS companies. SAS companies. So can you just read the question again? Sorry. Are there different criteria for valuing brick and mortar or traditional businesses versus tech SAS companies? Absolutely, absolutely. Some of that is embedded in the NAICS codes. So uh, some of it is value, uh, some of it's embedded in the comps. So if I live in an address in one town, my, and I was selling my house, my house would be valued against other houses in that town versus if I was in town B, my house might be valued differently based on being in town B. And that's where the comps and the underlying databases come in as comparative information. Um, And then there are also practices within the industry. 
And so, yes, you will see very different underlying methodology that goes in uh, into taking that valuation data that is being supplied and then turning it into a valuation outcome. Great. And uh, we've reached our last question, and that oh, is, good. according to your experience, when is the typical time when the companies get some value? Just the average second year in five or 10 years? Um, you know, it's really interesting. Um, there's some research out there that says that companies hit their optimal stride at about 20 years. Um, they they really have assembled the team, the vendor portfolio, the client portfolio. They've got everything clicking. Now, that's not to say that you can't do it in five years. We have as a client right now, a company that's been in business three years, and they were very aggressive at building the company, very smart about how they did it, and they are kicking butt. And their biggest fear is simply, we need to make sure that we get this infrastructure built fast enough that we don't blow it up in the next phase. Um, but I will tell you, probably somewhere between 10 and 20 years is where the company really hits its optimum value. I think I, I would like to add a caveat to that, which is use the valuation to figure out where you are because you want to make sure that you are making progress with what you're doing year after year and that your assumptions about what's building value actually are playing out. Okay, well, thank you so much, Andy. I think that'll do it for our questions. Okay, great. Well, if you're looking for help, um, put your contact info in the chat window, email us, give us a call. We'd love to talk to you. And I wanna thank all of you for joining us and invite you to come back Tell us what you'd like for webinars in 2022 and, and please um, come back in, in January. Thank you all for being here.